Welcome back to another episode of This Film Not Rated, a branch of the Drive-In Podcast Network, where we try to not rate movies. Well, rate them subjectively. Anyway, we do what we can to be as objective as possible on this show uh, to prove that it can be done, even though it's never been done before by anyone, including us. And uh, just for future reference, this is a spoiler-filled show. If you want the spoiler-free version, you have to go to the audio version. But uh, I think we're both excited for for this movie today. Uh, <gasps> so, uh, Eric, what what movie are we talking about today? Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. Volume Three, directed by James Gunn and starring everybody. Literally everybody. After the events of Avengers Endgame, as is the start of so many movies Uh post-Endgame, characters are in a low point. They're they're, uh, experiencing the aftermath of that event. And in the middle of that turmoil and the efforts to bring their society together, Rocket is attacked by a character from their past. And the Guardians must band together to face Rocket's roots in order to save his life and face off with the High Evolutionary in the process. So, that's the movie. Are you ready to face the gauntlet? Oh yeah. For this one, yeah. So, let's get the basic one out of the way is guardians volume three a good movie one person we know who uh runs the drive-in podcast network dislikes this movie is it the one i'm thinking it is ricky yeah it's the one i'm thinking it is um he is the only person i know so far to fully dislike this movie but i have seen commentary and criticisms aplenty for a movie that has overall experienced positive feedback online and in person. That's the answer you're going with? That's it. All right. Correct answer is... Exactly what you said. The the critical rating on Rotten Tomato is an 81% uh, with... A uh, average rating of 7.2, so around the same as uh, Evil Dead Rise oh, last week. Yeah. But the audience score is a whopping 75, 95%. The, the audience score is a whopping 95%, with the average being 4.7. So more people in the audience tended to like this movie better than critic, than, than people focus oh, on. on um, uh, sorry. Right. 4.7 out of 5. The yes. audience is... Yes, okay. four point seven out of five. So, general moviegoers tend to enjoy this movie a little bit more than the average critical viewer. That's funny that the critics are responding to this so similarly, numbers wise, uh, as Evil Dead Rise, and I'll have to talk more about that later. Uh, next up, I'm going to go with a with a particularly hard one because I want to. Who was the best actor in this movie? I think you'll find the correct answer is not Will Poulter. You have to remind me who Will Poulter is. I'm a terrible person. Uh, Adam the Warlock. Adam. Oh, not Will Poulter. Well, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm going to agree. It's not Will Poulter. <laughs> I think the whole world has to agree. It's not Will Poulter. So, 100 percent of people. Just the best. So your answer to who is the best actor? Is I not... can give you. I can give you another, a slightly more serious answer. Um, I do not know if Sean Gunn continued to play rocket on set opposite the other actors for this movie. But, uh, the idea of having to marry a completely digital, non-existent environment with an emotional performance that makes a talking animal Mm -hmm. invoke as much emotion as this seemed to evoke for the audience I was with, Uh I'd have to give Bradley Cooper more credit for his effect on the audience than I can give for any other actor in the movie. Hmm. All right, all right. 
Uh, this is one that I am particularly excited to hear what you have to say about it. What is the point of the story? You haven't even heard my rant yet. No, I haven't. You got me. Um, in, in The Suicide Squad, also directed by James Gunn. Yes. Ratcatcher is played by Taika Waititi. Mm hmm. Ratcatcher 2, his daughter, is the primary character that you see in the movie. He speaks to rats. He gives a speech, mm-hmm. a small, short speech, a line, really, about how rats are some of the most reviled and lowly creatures on the earth. Mm hmm. And if they can have meaning and purpose, then anyone can. That's your answer? Will that count as an answer? It's the same conclusion that, that 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 I came to while watching the movie. Okay, but it's an opinion though, so both of us you can <laughs> uh, and because so you much, know what? There's so much I... that, that 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 like there are so many points that you could take from from this movie that any answer you give would buzz you out. And this is the reason why I have to buzz myself out is because I actually completely disagree. I think mm-hmm. this movie was solidified proof that James Gunn may be the greatest blockbuster director because he can make something that has absolutely no meaning at all mm-hmm. feel like it has legendary consequences. <laughs> okay. You have to explain that one for me. So a lot of times superhero stories are morality tales or they're parables that are meant to, you know, and they don't have to be, but a lot of times they are movies that invoke some sort of message about how we overcome adversity as people with great power comes great responsibility. You Mm -hmm. either die the hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Yeah. Um, On paper, Mm -hmm. so much of this movie makes less sense and yet it is rocked so well in execution. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to stick with just Peter Quill, Star-Lord. Okay. His character's arc is he's lost everything and he's lost. Yeah. Okay? And it's because he feels like he's supposed to have this attachment with Gamora after having lost so many other people. Mm-hmm. And it hurts. Yeah. So there's the speech that's given to him through Drax yeah. about lily pads and learning to swim. Mm-hmm. If you just had drunk despair Peter Quill, Mm -hmm. who is told that, and then that point is proven to him, and then that causes him to decide to leave and go to Earth and find his roots, Mm -hmm. and start to decide who he is, there you would have a through line of an arc. Instead, what the movie is all about is... He's not appreciating what he has until it's almost gone. So then he fights the entire movie to get it back, then decides to leave and start that arc. Yeah, I guess so. so it's it's very weird how little there actually on paper is for how much this movie absolutely works beautifully. There there's really a lot to talk about. Like like even Oh my god. Like like j- just just the intro just the intro alone to this movie is so vastly different. Well, I say vastly. It's different than the other two, where the other two movies have this, like, very poppy, dancey, kind of, like, upbeat in, uh, in, in intro where one of the characters is dancing along to the music playing in the background. In the first one, it's Peter Quill. The second one, it's Groot. This one, it's it's Rocket walking around very, like, low shoulder solemn to, to Weezer's, I want to say Weezer's, to Radiohead's Creep. Uh, uh, the entire time, and like, it, like instantly, like, like that, that clicks you into uh, his 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 whole mindset for the rest of the movie. Uh, and then, not only that, the the movie itself feels more angry than any than any of the other Guardian movies. I just think it's the hardest PG thirteen movie in the MCU period. Oh, for sure. There, there, there are some shots like like when like when. Uh, Either Gamora, I think it's I think Mantis is is covering the chest wound on Rocket, and you can see the blood kind of pooling around her hand. Like I wasn't expecting that from a, from a PG thirteen movie. That, that 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 was a little like hard. The way Rocket sort of turns into a, a horror creature for a second there, clawing yeah. the face off of somebody. Yes. Um. 
the deadpan gunshot deaths of of creatures like mm-hmm. i um which we should bring up this is the thing like they 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 said this before the movie and uh the, this is the MCU's first M- f bomb oh it is yep i i knew that line struck me for some reason it's like hey he said fuck <laughs> why is it's that weird so... to me it's it's the first one ever like <laughs> Uh, to, to be fair, so like, so like, uh, what I said about it being my criticism, mm. this movie and Black Panther two stand as two of the most emotional, personal movies that still have the MCU trying to stuff some stuff into it, mm-hmm. and it doesn't matter because the core of what's there works. Now that's wildly different. This is nothing like Black Panther two, yeah. but uh, just man, I, I I I felt so hard. For Star Lord, and I feel like there's something about that character that probably resonates with a lot of people, where we're all still kind of coping with losses over the last couple of years, uh-huh. and it's just somebody who's just like, they're just surviving. Yeah, and I I, I stand by that Mantis, and this is why I, I had a struggle with 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 the best actor in the movie. Okay. She masterfully rides the tone of this movie better than anybody else to me. Okay. At the, at, at, at the, on a turn on a dime at the, at the head of a pin, she can flip between the hardcore off the wall screwing around humor of the movie. Yeah. And genuine heartfelt emotion. Like her defending Drax while calling him dumb. Yes works as a genuinely emotional appeal for the character and is mm-hmm. hilarious at the same time. Right. And Nebula has become such a character. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, I think this is the most we've seen of her in any of the MCU movies. Like, in, in, in Guardians 1, she's just generic bad guy who's opposite of Gamora. In Guardians 2, you start to see a little bit of it. You start to see a little bit of, of like sibling jealousy between her, but there's not much more than that for Nebula in Guardians 2. She's barely in the Infinity War movies, so this is the first time you really get a good look at her in any of these movies. But uh, as far as criticisms go, like I, 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 I'm, I'm mixed on mine. Because when I first saw this movie, uh, and I, I, I saw the Master Ev- Evolutionary, and him present day versus him in in the past how present day he's more mechanical he has like this he, he has the robocop face the joke that peter quill makes and my first thought was oh he is so not comfortable with natural organic things he even operated on himself because he saw himself as not perfect that's an in, that's an interesting concept but instead it's just rocket tearing up his face so he's hiding it which is great for rocket but but why does that make it not what you're saying Instead of allowing himself to be scarred, he did what he did. Uh, like, but instead of him doing it because he's scarred, him seeing himself as not perfect, regardless of being scarred or not, and working constantly to change his imperfections would have worked with the character. I feel like what you're saying is still there in some way, but it's, I get that it would have been more... Yeah. It, like, there's something that's mixed right. about it. It, it, it. it felt like they, they were sacrificing a bit of one character a bit of one character to bring one to bring another up. And yeah, but this is, and this is another thing that I really loved about the movie is it's, I I don't need to care more about the villain. Yeah. I love how much they were just like, Oh my gosh, dude, shut up. (laughs) It it was, it was such a great sort of tone to have on a guy who's like, who the guy's Mm -hmm. a great actor. He gives a great performance as that character, but it's just like, and it's so rare because so often, like a superhero movie is made by its its villain. Uh-huh. The villains are sort of free and driven and passionate, and they sort of have they drive the plot forward. Uh-huh. But no, this this was a plot driven by a hero wanting to save someone close to them. Yeah, and so the villain was like a blob on the side of that. Yeah, it's like an that's... infection that stood in the way. Yeah, that that's the, that's the that's that's the other thing. Like like the 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 overall story itself is very confined it's not overly complex like mm-hmm. uh, like I, like i i would say like guardians one but in guardians one it's it's we need to stop this guy from destroying a planet and in this one the guy destroys a planet but they're not trying to save the planet they're trying to save rocket 
So yeah. the planet being destroyed is inconsequential to the Guardians' uh, goal. Well, they do in, end up trying to save the next Earth, you know? But um, they are smaller scale in yeah. terms of scope. Even the first Guardians was, like, they are the Guardians of the galaxy, and there is one planet in danger. Yeah. It's like Spider-Man being confined to saving the neighborhood instead of all of the world or all of New York. Right. I, and I agree with that. I think the, the more personal, the better. Um, I don't know why James Gunn's got to make aliens so gross. <laughs> what is his thing about aliens got to be gross? I did like, I did like the, the, the tables turning joke where the normal looking humans are coming down on, on counter earth and they're the aliens as opposed to the mix mm-hmm. of animal races on there. And they, they have the exact same reaction that I think oh, humans would. To be fair, they're not gross. Oh. I'm talking about the living, the living oh. spaceship oh. <laughs> with the hair sticking out and the fat globules inside the tissue that they're all singeing out. And the actual and eyes the... as cameras. Oh my gosh. The security guards are all globby with like yeah. these stick outy like uh, mm. so upsetting. Nathan Fillion constantly trying to relate to people by saying, he's a moron, yeah? I've got one of those. I feel uh, like I'm going to kill him one day. And he gets to be Nathan Fillion. He gets to be like, show his face and yeah. be here. He uh, he was Wonder Man and he was cut out of Guardians 2. Mm. Uh, so he didn't get to be that character. Mm. Um, but in the first Guardians, he is the blue alien that Groot pulls up by the nose. Yeah, that, that is true. Like, it just feels so rich to get into... The drive of these characters, like one of the big things that people, I don't see a lot of people talking about is um, Gamora and and Star Lord. Yeah, it's it, it, it's a complex mm-hmm. r- relationship now because you have you have Star Lord convinced that he can get this Gamora to remember something that she's just never going to remember, or maybe mm-hmm. he knows he's just doing whatever he can to try and get some semblance of normal of normalcy back in a way i thought i thought for a second that there was going to be a moment where mantis touched the both of them Mm -hmm. and gamora felt how how peter felt for her Mm -hmm. or went so far as to transfer a memory yeah there is a little bit of a payoff because by the end, like at the very beginning of of, of, of this movie, there there's clear animosity from from Gamora to Peter Quill and her not understanding why she would ever fall for this guy. And then by the end, nothing is said, but just by the way the character is acting around Peter now, you get the sense that she understands why now. But she has a new family, and that's who she's going with. And, and it, that, you, you know, you know who they are. Hmm. They are. They are the edgier version of Fry and Leela from Futurama. Yeah, they kind of are, actually. Time and again, Leela and Fry are together, finally. Uh And then there are times when they split up. But the idea is every time they end up heated, it's, it's proven through their actions for one another that they care about each other so much that Leela, the, the tough guy, alien and star Lord, the, red jacket wearing redhead um yep. who was in pursuit of her um it just it, that's that's i'm really glad they stuck with that dynamic that it was through his actions and his their time together that she became to understand him and it really is that when that character naturally gets to know his character better she loves him she cares about him and then there's drax's whole thing uh, mm-hmm. which would they call out what they've been doing with his character since the beginning, which is sort of nerfing him. And, and they, they allowed him to be a little bit more of a destructive presence in this movie, mm-hmm. but you have the perfect character Nebula get pissed off and call him out for what he's been. Mm-hmm. And then you have the perfect character Mantis, like apologize and explain him. And then his role of getting to be like a father, like it is such a big thing. Like, there are so many little moments in these movies that in this movie that are big and have big consequence for these characters in their lives. But Mm -hmm. 
I, I I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they they packed so much into one movie, even though it is very long. Yeah, it's it's about two hour. It's it's about two and a half hours long, and despite there being like ten ish main characters, like they all get just enough screen time to flesh them out and make it feel balanced. Like no one feels like they've been left out for yep. time reasons. There's even there's even time for uh, Sean Gunn's character to have a whole little arc. Yeah, with 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 with, with Cosmo. Oh yeah, yeah, Cosmo, Cosmo who. Who has more development than Adam Warlock in this movie? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I don't understand what happened with Adam Warlock. I don't want to harp on that too much, but you know, he saw his mother die. I thought that would make him vengeful towards the High Evolutionary, but instead, he just keeps going after Rocket. Yeah. Back around the time Guardians Two get got out, and I need confirmation from other people for this to make sure I didn't like forget it, or it's not like a, a Mandela effect thing. I am fairly certain James Gunn said positively because of the Adam Warlock tease in the mm-hmm. trailers that Adam Warlock was not going to be in Guardians 3. <laughs> well, he's in Guardians 3. Uh... That starts this parallel between James Gunn and Sam Raimi that I think holds up really well even under scrutiny. They are both have horror roots. Indie mm-hmm. horror roots. Yeah. Who then got attached to a comic book property that they dearly love, but focused primarily on the characters and things about it that they love. Guardians, mm. these Guardians do yeah. not reflect the comic books. Almost no. at all. Right. But they are lovable in what they are, in the love that James Gunn has for this property, in what he made out of it. Mm-hmm. Adam Warlock is the character in the comics who brought down Thanos in the infinity gauntlet. Adam Warlock is, is a key character to that entire Mm. saga. So even Adam Warlock isn't fully Adam Warlock in this movie. I, there has got to be some diehard fans out there who are as upset about this as Mm -hmm. people were about Venom and Spider-Man three. But who knows who knows Adam Warlock versus Venom? I think it's yeah. the reason why this is not getting the same reaction from people. Uh-huh. I don't know Adam Warlock that well. I thought he was fine. I was happy with it. But yeah. the thing is, I am also I also think they do a good job in Spider Man three uh-huh. with making that character work for the story they're trying to tell, even though he was a studio note that was shoehorned in. Right. You can see on screen, mm-hmm. and you could see this in the Suicide Squad, and you can see this in the Guardians of the Galaxy. You can tell which characters James Gunn has passion for and which ones he does not. But um, how do you feel about Groot? Groot? Uh, I feel like every time I see Groot, he's a new character. And this he is. It's, 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 it's no different in this one. He get, He gets more beefy. In this one, than he was in the first Swole one. Swole Groot, yeah. Swole Groot, He's, yeah. Uh, and then he becomes King Groot in the end credits. That that, by the way, that look where very particularly he has a couple of like sp- spikes on his head, yeah, uh, is a reference to the character from different times in the comics and mm. also in the video game Marvel Contest of Champions that I've been playing for like six years. It's so bizarre mm-hmm. because Groot's just presence of being there. I was kind of pointing out that. It's very it's very different because uh, I, I never realized until this movie that Peter Quill and Rocket's relationship was so personal because they were essentially co-parents to Groot. Right. Gamora was gone. Drax was not a parent to Groot. He didn't understand him. Mm-hmm. So it was just Rocket and Peter Quill co-parenting Groot. But in the original movie, Groot was his own adult. Yeah. Who sacrificed himself for them. That's a separate character. But then, like, having him grow up from a baby into a snarky teenager, now he starts to become his own adult again, and they have to treat him like an adult, and they stand by, and it just... He goes back to having that sort of magical, comforting presence of being there and and being muscle when he needs to be muscle and protection when he needs to be protection. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting seeing him and Star-Lord as, like, combat buddies, the way that Rocket and Groot were in the first one. Yeah. Because Rocket can't be there, but it's kind of through action showing you that Peter Quill has formed that same bond 
that they had. All right. And that uh, that that's this movie has some of my favorite action sequences in the in the MCU ever. Uh, one of them being that explosion up to them jumping out of the building, mm-hmm. where they tackle Mateo from Superstore. Yeah. Um, and the hallway scene. And the hallway scene. I had a feeling <gasps> it was going to be that one. Are you going to watch this again? Oh, for sure. Like, this they, is like they, a go-to. This is like a staple now of like for sure. Like the oh man. Yeah, like I, I I like both Guardian movies and now all 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 three of them. Uh, I don't know if this is number one or number two for me now, but I, I I can honestly say that number that that volume two is the bottom of the three movies for me. But they're all great in their own rights. But uh, like this the the premise behind one and three are so simple. As far as getting behind the character's motivations, it's it's easy to fall into that uh, that sci-fi world and and just follow the characters along. It, it's it's almost like the sci-fi doesn't matter. It's the characters you're there for. Where with two, you're you're there for the characters, but it's 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 more involved in the sci-fi world than anything else. Uh, I, I I I I like how dark this uh, this uh, movie went. Uh, the the emotional intensity that that you get from literally every character. Is something that's very new to the Guardian movies. Um, the thing is, I don't think I was ready. I don't think I am am ready yet. I don't think my brain is processing yet. It hurting to no longer have installments with this cast. Yeah. To for them to not be a thing anymore. Yeah. yeah. The the end credits makes it clear that at the very least Star Lord is coming back, but that's that's a about it you yeah, get no even say the guardians will return yeah no no view on rocket or or Groot coming back Gamora she's with the ravager she's on her I, own thing I, now I'm sure they will but the thing is it won't be a James Gunn movie starring this cast with needle drops and that touch of exploring aliens that I mean you look at this versus Ant-Man and the Wasp mm-hmm. that that's exploring a foreign alien like weird universe yeah contrasting that movie with this movie shows you night and day that there is a right way to explore the unknown Uh and a way that just comes across as just passive and boring. Uh, Once again, once again, we are this film not rated a branch of the drive in podcast network. Uh, I'm Curtis. You can find me, on Twitter at TalkAnimeGA and on Twitch at Merrick underscore Tainment. I'm Merrick. You can find me at High Contrast FLM on Twitter and pretty much anywhere. All right. But uh, no, just real quick, going back to to the Groot thing. What what did what? you think about Groot saying uh, not uh, I am Groot for for once and actually using different words? Talking at about very... Groot saying something other than I am Groot. <laughs> yeah. What? When? At the very end of the movie. Like when he's dancing with everyone? No. When when they're when when they're saying their goodbyes, and yeah. they're all and, and they're all about to go their separate ways. Yeah. Groot just says, says, "I, I love you." Groot. Go. He's a, <laughs> okay. Now I now I know you're. Did joking. you hear something different? <laughs> did you finally learn to understand his language like Gamora did? Over I the knew. Entire you, movie? I knew you were going this way. I knew you were doing this shit.